reviewing the May 2019 Watchtower Study Edition for the week of July 8th through 14th. This is the JW Review. Hello, everyone. A welcome to the JW Review podcast. Uh, my name is Mike Felker, and this is the weekly podcast where we look at uh, next week's Watchtower Study Edition, and we just compare it to what the scriptures teach. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, you can go to michaeljfelker.com, and uh, you can find out much more about what I do, uh, more about me personally. And uh, there you can see uh, these weekly Watchtower reviews, and you can also see uh, the weekly meeting workbook reviews, which are actually uh, written reviews. So uh, I am uh, not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not an ex-Jehovah's Witness, and I've never had any a formal association uh, with uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, this week's uh, review is going to be very interesting because we are covering something that I don't think I've ever covered really uh, on this podcast, and that is uh, the Watchtower's uh, child abuse policies. And so, unless you've been living under a rock, um, well, I guess unless you're, you've had any familiarity with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you may not know about this. But if you do have any familiarity with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know that uh, in the past, I would say, maybe two or three years, uh, they have been making headlines, literally, uh, as it relates to uh, their child abuse policies. And most noteworthy of that is the Australia Royal uh, Commission. And if you just Google Australian Royal Commission, you're going to find uh, tons of stuff uh, online about that. And I would encourage you especially uh, to watch uh, the videos, uh, the videos where um, a governing body member uh, was uh, basically interrogated uh, uh, by the Australian Royal Commission, I think it was. I can't remember who was interrogating them, but uh, anyway, it was a very, very uh, interesting uh, interrogation. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, watching those and just doing a lot more reading on this uh, because, to be honest with you, uh, this isn't an area that I've done a, a ton of research on. And uh, But because this was our weekly article um, dealing with child abuse, it did force me to do a whole lot of uh, digging uh, into this issue. And so um, what I like to do on this podcast is I, I like to do more of a scriptural uh, examination of these things. And so, uh, w which basically means you're not going to see as much here where I'm looking at like court cases, court transcripts, and uh, things like that. And that stuff is extremely important. And uh, But what I'm saying is I think there are others out there who are uh, far more, um, with far more expertise uh, to delve into those things, uh, especially when it uh, pertains to legal things and uh, other other things of that nature. And so uh, that stuff's very important. Um, but what I want to do here is just try to take as much of a scriptural uh, approach as I can. Uh, so uh, this article is titled, Love and Justice in the Face of Wickedness. And I would say it's about time uh, the Watchtower has uh, put something in print as it relates to child abuse. Now, the last thing, as far as I'm aware, that they've actually put in print uh, is this document here. It's, uh, it's titled, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses' Scripturally Based Position on Child Protection. So if you go to jw.org, and I, I think if you just search for child protection, uh, this article is going to uh, pop right up. And this is their official policy on uh, child protection. And it's a good thing they did post something like this because I, I think this was a long overdue. And as you may well know, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't exactly known for responding to their critics. Their usual position is uh, silence. Uh, let's just forget about people out there like me or like you who are making uh, public statements uh, about them. It, it's a rarity that the Watchtower makes any kind of uh, public response against accusations. But I think this whole issue has just blown up so much and that it's become so public. Uh, they've just been forced to uh, respond because I know a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, even faithful 
Jehovah's Witnesses have probably written in uh, to the headquarters to get some type of official uh, response on this because uh, you could dig through uh, JW.org and the online library uh, to try to find uh, policies, uh, written, stated policies on uh, child abuse and what to do if you are in that kind of uh, situation. Uh, so uh, we're going to not do a full review of this uh, of this uh, this policy here, but we are going to look at just a few things that I've highlighted uh, in light of this uh, Watchtower article. I don't think this is going to be the last thing the Watchtower ever says on this, uh, but this was their chance uh, to really put something into print, uh, something very recent, uh, to where we can look at this and say, oh, okay, I know where uh, the Watchtower uh, stands on this, or better yet, I know where the governing body uh, stands on this. So I would otherwise want to read this whole article, but I just don't think uh, we have the time uh, to do that. So uh, we're just going to... Uh, look at some highlighted uh, portions on this. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, if you notice the uh, the video quality is a little better, uh, that's because I got a new iPhone 10s, and that is what I am using to uh, shoot this video. So I'm really hoping uh, that the quality improves here. And this actually uh, led me to some ideas to be making a higher quality videos. Otherwise, uh, outside of the Watchtower weekly reviews, to do maybe some more. Uh, topical videos and uh, things like that. So uh, be on the lookout uh, for that. So the key text for this uh, this article is uh, Psalm 5-4. Uh, you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. So uh, the Watchtower emphasizes time and time again in this article and other articles uh, dealing with child abuse how much they hate child sexual abuse, and the first paragraph here highlights that. Uh, Jehovah God hates all form of wickedness, how we must hate child abuse, an especially repugnant wicked deed. In imitation of Jehovah, we as his witnesses abhor child abuse and do not tolerate it in the Christian congregation. So that is their sentiments, that is their feelings. You can find uh, plenty of articles stating how much they hate child abuse, how much they do not tolerate it. Um, you're going to find plenty of that. But what we will say is that actions speak louder than words. So that's the point here. So it's not so much uh, what they say, it's about what they actually do. Okay, and that's what we're going to highlight here. So let's go to uh, paragraph 7. And uh, what I am most concerned with, and I think a lot of what uh, you're most concerned with, is how all of this child abuse stuff and the Watchtower's policies, how it relates to uh, the secular uh, authorities, right? And uh, just to emphasize this, let's look at Romans uh, 13. This is an extremely uh, important passage. Uh, 13.1, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause for fear, uh, for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God for you, uh, to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So we see here how important it is to recognize uh, the governing authorities in your land, whether you like them or not. They are there for a reason. They are established there by God for a reason, and that is to punish crime. That is to punish crime. They're not there to punish fornication because in most lands uh, fornication is not a crime but they're to punish crime and child abuse in most lands or all lands as far as I know is a crime and so they 
are the ones who are to deal with crimes, whether you like them or not, whether you agree with them or not. That is what they are there for. Now, outside of that, you can do what your religion teaches you to do as far as how you deal with a criminal who's in your congregation. That's kind of a separate issue. Uh, but as far as the crime itself, the governing authorities are the ones who are to deal with that. So now that we've kind of laid that groundwork, let's look at what paragraph 7 says. A sin against the secular authorities. Christians are to be in subjection to the superior authorities. Romans 13.1, that's what we just read. We prove our subjection by showing due respect for the laws of the land. If someone in the congregation becomes guilty of violating a criminal law, such as by committing child abuse, he is sinning against the secular authorities. While the elders are not authorized to enforce the law of the land, they do not shield any perpetrator of child abuse from the legal consequences of his sin. The sinner reaps what he has sown. Now, this is extremely bothersome to me, and I think it's going to be extremely bothersome to you, whether you're a faithful Jehovah's Witness or not. This should be bothersome to you. What they're basically putting themselves in is kind of like a position of neutrality on this issue. They're saying, well, we won't stop you from reporting a child abuse. We're, we're, not, we're not stopping anybody from doing that. We're not discouraging it directly. You know, so in other words, you know, if you see someone abusing a child and you're in that situation, you, you know, do, do, do what you're, we're not stopping you from, from reporting that, right? So, and this is where actions speak louder than words, because what does Romans 13 say? It says that the abuser, the one committing a crime, is in subjection to the governing authorities, and they're sinning against the governing authorities. So, in other words, you should turn these criminals over to the governing authorities. So, it, this is not to be passively addressed. But what paragraph 7 is basically saying is that this is a passive thing. They're not stopping you from turning them over to the governing authorities. And what I want to ask here, and what I'm going to ask again and again, is where is the encouragement, where is the directive on what Jehovah's Witnesses, whether it's the rank and file or the elders, where is the directive, the action, the plan on what you should do if you're encountering a child abuse situation? Because what the council should be is that you should allow the governing authorities to handle this. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to work things out on your own, too. Of course you should. These are children. This is about the children. Of course you should do everything in your power uh, to, uh, to take action, but you should also allow the governing authorities because they're the ones who also have expertise in this area. You don't have the expertise. Your elders don't have the expertise. And the Watchtower headquarters does not have the expertise to address this. Yes, do everything you can. Take things into your own hands if necessary. But again, it's the governing authorities. The governing authorities that Romans chapter 13 says that should be handling this because your sin is against them. All right, let's move on. Paragraph 9. Over the years, Jehovah's Organization has provided an abundance of scriptural information on the subject of child abuse. For example, articles in the Watchtower and Awake have discussed how those who have been sexually abused can deal with emotional scars, how others can help and encourage them, and how parents can protect their children. Elders have received detailed scriptural training on how to handle the sin of child abuse. 
the organization continues to review the way congregations handle the sin of child abuse. Why? To make sure that our way of handling the matter is in harmony with the law of Christ. Basically, what they're uh, saying here is that they've written a lot of stuff about child abuse, and yes, they have. They have written a lot of stuff about child abuse, but a lot of this is more about preventative means of handling child abuse and how to handle people who have already been abused, all right? How to handle the emotional scars and things like that. Very little, as far as I know, has been written insofar as how to deal with the legal aspects of this, how to report it, how to deal uh, with the uh, governing authorities. That is something that is uh, missing from a lot of these uh, discussions. But also, it says here, elders have received detailed scriptural training. Now, we all know that you can't find, well, you're not supposed to be able to find out what this detailed scriptural training is. But is that really fair that a Jehovah's Witness can read this? And the faithful Jehovah's Witness just simply cannot find out, or he's not supposed to find out, what this detailed scriptural training is. You're just supposed to believe them, that they've received this. But uh, we, we all know where that scriptural training is found. It's in the elder's handbook that is confidential and is for the elder's eyes only, not for uh, the rank and file. And I think at this point, it is wrong uh, for the Watchtower to be intentionally withholding this detailed scriptural training from everyone else, especially in light of what has been happening in these uh, child abuse uh, situations that are happening all over the world. At the very least, I think the Watchtower should publicly release uh, what this uh, scriptural uh, training is. And also they say here that the way of handling the matter is in harmony with the law of Christ. Now, again, this is just spiritualizing everything. I'm not saying there aren't scriptural and religious aspects of this that should be um, addressed, no doubt about that, but we're concerned with the legal ram ramifications, right? If you go to jw.org, the online library, uh, do some searches uh, with keywords contacting the authorities or contacting police and any variation of those words, and you're going to find little to nothing uh, about that on the online library. And I think that is really, really noteworthy here. Paragraph 10. When elders handle any matter involving serious wrongdoing, also known as crimes, uh, they keep in mind that the law of Christ requires that they treat the flock with love and do what is right and just in God's eyes. Oh, that means reporting a crime to the authorities, right? As a result, they have a number of concerns when they receive a report of serious wrongdoings. Okay, what are those concerns? What are those concerns and what do you actually do when you receive reports of crimes? What do you do? The elders are primarily concerned with maintaining the sanctity of God's name. Now that means obeying Romans chapter 13, right? They are also deeply concerned with the spiritual wel welfare of their brothers and sisters in the congregation and want to help any who have been victims of wrongdoings. Now, does that mean just taking matters into your own hands and doing your own investigations? Well, yes, it should involve that. But again, it involves letting the secular authorities handle this because that's what Romans chapter 13 says to do, right? Paragraph 11. In addition, if the wrongdoer is a part of the congregation, elders are concerned with trying to restore him if that is possible. Okay, but after you've allowed the secular authorities to handle this. So, so yes, no one is beyond God's grace totally in, in agreement there. Uh, but again, is this after the secular authorities have handled this? Where do the secular authorities come into play here? The Watchtower is just conspicuously silent on this so far in this article. And why? 
A Christian who gives in to the wrong desire and commits a sin is spiritually sick. That means he is no longer he th- this means that he no longer has a healthy relationship with Jehovah. In a sense, the elders are spiritual phys- physicians. Fine and well, okay? Give him that, but where do the, do the secular authorities come into play here? Paragraph 12. Clearly, elders have a weighty responsibility. They care deeply about the flock that God has entrusted to them. They want their brothers and sisters to feel secure in the congregation. For that reason, they act promptly when they receive a report of serious wrongdoing. Okay? What does acting promptly mean? Well, we're about to see that when we do a quick review of their scripturally based position on child protection. And it's going to tell us here uh, what they're supposed to do in relation to contacting the authorities. But first, let's look at paragraph 13. Do elders comply with secular laws about reporting an allegation of child abuse to the secular authorities? Yes. Now, Let's stop there for a second. What does compliance mean? Compliance means that if the law requires the reporting of the abuse, then they report the abuse. But what if the law doesn't um, require the reporting of the abuse? Do they report it? Should they report it? Well, let's find out. In places where such laws exist, elders endeavor to comply with secular laws about reporting allegations of abuse. Such laws do not conflict with God's law. So when they learn of an accusation, elders immediately seek direction on how they comply with laws about reporting. Now, they don't tell us here what type of direction they're seeking. That's kind of vague. Does that mean they're seeking direction from the secular authorities? Does that mean they're seeking direction from the Watchtower organization? Now, remember here, it says they promptly act. They promptly act. So what that implies here is they're picking up the phone, they're calling the police, and they're finding out, hey, what should I do about this? Uh, I I just received an allegation that there's a child being abused. What What do I do here, police? Is that what they're talking about here? Well, let's find out. Let's go over to their scripturally based position on child protection. In point three, it says, Jehovah's Witness abhor child abuse and view it as a crime. Yeah, because it is a crime. We recognize that the authorities are responsible for addressing such crimes. So does that mean that each and every time that an elder or the rank and file hear about child abuse, that they report it to the authorities, and knowing that the authorities are responsible for this? Is that what actually happens? If that's the case, then why do we hear about so many unreported child abuse cases? There shouldn't be any, or there should be very few, right? If you recognize the authorities are responsible for this, then why not let them be responsible for this? Why is it that the secular authorities are the ones taking Jehovah's Witnesses into the courts and trying to get them to turn over their unreported cases? Actions speak louder than words. Point three. In all cases, victims and their parents have the right to report an accusation of child abuse. Therefore, victims, their parents, or anyone else who reports such an accusation to the elders are clearly informed by the elders that they have the right to report the matter to the authorities. Elders do not criticize anyone who chooses to make such a report. So this is, again, going back to that passive stance on child abuse. They're saying, we're not going to stop you from doing this. But in point three, is that elder authorities have the response, the responsibility for address. So, so which is it? Should a Jehovah's Witness report this, or should they not report this? Why are they taking this passive stance rather than the active stance and saying, "Turn this over to the authorities because they have the expertise and they are the ones responsible for this." 
So now here's what we find out as far as what elders are to do in this situation. When elders learn of an accusation of child abuse, they immediately consult with the branch office of Jehovah's Witnesses to ensure compliance with child abuse reporting laws. Even if the elders have no legal duty to report an accusation to the authorities, the branch office of Jehovah's Witnesses will instruct the elders to report the matter if the minor is still in danger of abuse or if there's some other valid reason. So you've really got to read this carefully because it does sound like they're giving a directive here, but they're really not, right? Now, how do you know if a minor is still in danger? I think that requires investigation. But does the, does the elders or even the branch office have the expertise to be investigating like this? Well, the answer is no. They don't have expertise on this. The authorities do. So we're going back to reporting this to the authorities. Now, remember back in this article, uh, the Watchtower article in paragraph 13, in paragraph 12, where it says they rep they promptly act? What does promptly act mean? Promptly act means they're supposed to contact the Watchtower headquarters to find out what to do? Is that really promptly acting? No. I understand that they want to find out what the child abuse reporting laws are. Great, there's nothing wrong with that. But again, it's not the Watchtower's responsibility to find out how we should be investigating this. It's the authority's responsibility. Now, everyone knows how to call 911, right? Everyone knows how to call the police, right? They're the ones you should be promptly calling to find out what the laws of the land are because they're the ones responsible for telling you uh, what the laws of the land are and how to act. Now, if they don't do a good job of that, you know, then that's on them, right? That's on them, but again, it's not it's not your job, really, uh, to find out if they're gonna do if they're doing a, a good job or that or not. Now you can take matters into your own hands. I would encourage you to do that if the secular authorities aren't doing a great job, but they're the ones who are responsible before God in doing the right thing or the wrong thing. But read Romans chapter thirteen, right? Because a sin is against them. And they are the ones ultimately responsible before God in addressing these crimes. So the Watchtower here, I think, is giving really bad advice. Now, it may be that after you've reported this to the secular authorities, that, yeah, sure, call, contact uh, the branch office and find out, did I do everything that I could do in this situation? I've already contacted the police. They've told me what to do. I've taken all this action. And what else can I do uh, beyond this? Now, I think that would be a perfectly appropriate directive, but that is not the directive here in uh, points four and five in the Watchtower's uh, directive here, right? That is just not what they are uh, directing. And so I think what ends up happening here, if I'm not mistaken, is that oftentimes if they find out that, oh, well, there's no law requiring you to report this, Mr. Elder, right? So here's what we want you to do. Or were there two witnesses? And they go through the different types of steps to address this in a spiritual way and to see if this if this perpetrator should be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So in that sense, they're just taking a uh, judicial approach, not a legal approach, but a judicial approach in how to address this situation. Then they kind of go down the line and then uh, you're left with a perpetrator who is not criminally charged with this, but they are spiritually charged, and maybe they get disfellowshipped. This, this but in that situation, the children are ultimately not the ones who are protected. Paragraph 15. In the congregation, before the elders take judicial action, why are at least two witnesses required? This requirement is part of the Bible's high standard of justice. When there is no confession of wrongdoing, two witnesses are required to establish the accusation and authorize the elders to take judicial action. Does this mean that before an allegation of abuse can be reported to the authorities, two witnesses are re required? 
No, this requirement does not apply to whether elders or others report allegations of a crime. When they learn that someone in the congregation is accused of child abuse, elders endeavor to comply with any secular laws about reporting the matter. And then they conduct a scriptural investigation. If the individual denies the accusation, the elders consider the testimony of witnesses. If at least two people, the one making the accusation and someone else who can verify this act or other acts of child abuse by the accused, establish the charge a judicial committee is formed. The absence of a second witness does not mean that the one making the accusation is untruthful. Even if a charge of wrongdoing cannot be established by two witnesses, the elders recognize that a serious sin may have been committed one that deeply hurt others. The elders provide ongoing support to any individuals who may have been hurt. In addition, the elders remain alert regarding the alleged abuser to protect the congregation from potential danger. Let's stop here. You've really got to read this carefully because I think most Jehovah's Witnesses are going to read paragraph 16 and say, oh wow, it looks like they're all doing uh, the right thing here. But are they? Because it sounds like, if you're not reading this carefully, that they're saying, oh yeah, you report this to the authorities, they take care of everything, they do their job, and they do all what they're supposed to do from a legal perspective. But then, after that, you go and apply scriptural directives to this, and you allow the elders to handle this in a judicial way, in a scriptural and spiritual way, and they handle, handle it that way. So again, the legal takes place over here, they do their thing, and the watchtower and the elders and everyone else does their own thing. But is that really what they're saying here? Well, no, it's not. Because all it's really saying here is that you find out if there's any legal requirement for you to report this. And I think what happens most of the time is that they find out, oh, well, no, there's not a legal requirement here, so we don't contact the authorities, and we just let the elders handle it. If I'm not mistaken, I think that is what's happening in most cases here, and that's why you're finding out that there is just a plethora of, of unreported cases out there. And so what we have here is not necessarily a broken criminal system, although we there might be that, but we have a broken watchtower policy system. That is what is happening here. Paragraph 17. What is the role of the judicial committee? The term judicial does not mean that the elders judge or rule on whether the abuser should be punished by the authorities for breaking the law. The elders do not interfere with law enforcement. They leave criminal matters to the secular authorities. But that just assumes that the crime has been reported. That assumes the crime has been reported. So the watchtower here, they're just not addressing the real issue. And that's whether you should or not report a crime to the authorities. Which is it? Why aren't they clear on this? I think they're not clear on this. Is that they can just leave things be. Right? They can just let the legal happen if there's a requirement. And they can take things into their own hands. Right? But a lot of times the elders just don't know what to do here. They contact the branch, and they're told there's no law requiring this, and then they just conduct their scriptural investigation, whatever that may be. Now, let's talk about this whole idea of judicial committees. Now, there is just no biblical basis whatsoever about judicial committees, right? About elders uh, doing these kinds of things that, are, that they're doing. Elders behind closed doors in these judicial committees or maybe a perpetrator is before them, and they're deciding uh, what to do. There's just simply no scriptural basis for judicial committees, right? And and believe me, you can read all of these uh, scriptural passages that are quoted here. You're not going to find a thing here about uh, judicial committees. So again, you've got a broken uh, policy system here uh, with uh, the Watchtower. 
And uh, paragraph 18, when elders serve on a judicial committee, their role is spiritual or religious, guided by the scriptures. They judge whether the abuser is repentant or not. If he is unrepentant, he is expelled, and an announcement is made to the congregation. Okay, let's take a big stop right there. Now, when an announcement is made to the congregation, are they told what the offense is? Are they told why this person is no longer with Jehovah's Witnesses? I don't think they are. Now, I've never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I've never sat there in the Kingdom Hall when this announcement is made. But as far as I know, even in these cases of child abuse, they are not announced as a child abuser. If I'm wrong on that, please correct me. right? But as far as I know, they're not told why this person is being expelled. And so everyone is left to speculate. And you know what I think this turns into? I think this turns into a lot of gossip. I think that's what ends up happening there. And I think this whole silence on why this person is being disfellowshipped, it really fuels gossip. Now, of course, everyone is responsible for their own sins, no doubt about that. But why, when you have child abuse, and this person is left to walk on the streets, even if he's expelled from the congregation, why are they not told about what actually happened. Why is everyone left to their own speculations on why this person is being uh, disfellowshipped? Why is that? Now, this next part has many articles, and what the Watchtower is going to say here is that, well, we have this whole record, this whole record of our stances on child abuse and how much we hate it and what we do when a, a perpetrator is uh, brought into our midst, right? And look at all this history here. Now, I actually read through all of this, and I found little to nothing about policies on reporting the abuse to the authorities. Almost nothing. Now, I found one thing here about uh, reporting uh, to the authorities, but in that case, the reporting was actually criticized and they just talked about how the legal system is often broken to when you report things, uh, the authorities sometimes do nothing. Other than that, all you find here in these articles are preventative measures or how to cope if you've uh, been abused, right? And those kinds of things are great. They're well, right? But what we want to know here is where is the directive on whether we should report the child abuse to the authorities or not? Why is the Watchtower not giving us directives on that and just leaving you to your uh, to your own own devices? Why, why is that? Because oftentimes what I think happens is the rank and file who, who finds out about the abuse, they just tell the elders and think, oh, the elders are going to handle this. We trust the elders. And then the elders pass this off to the headquarters and the headquarters say, well, there's no law requiring this, so, you know, do your scriptural investigation. Is that protecting the child? No, it's not protecting the child. Paragraph 22. Educate your children. Share with them age-appropriate information about sex. Teach them what to say and do if someone tries to touch them in an inappropriate way. Use the information that God's organization has provided on how to protect your children. I think we have found that the Watchtower's information is very, very flawed. No matter how much they state till they're blue in the face, how much they hate child abuse, actions speak louder than words. So at the end of this, we need to ask ourselves... Is the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses obeying Romans chapter 13 in allowing the authorities to do what God has established them to do, and that is addressing crimes and punishing evil? Are we giving them that chance? Is the watchtower giving them that opportunity as often as possible? 
to address these crimes. So I know this review is very heavy, and I know this affects a lot of you personally, and a lot of, of you have told me that this is one of the uh, cornerstones as to why uh, you have decided to not be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses feel the same way. Uh, that this was kind of the nail in the coffin as to uh, why you cannot be a part of this organization as to, as to their child abuse policies and how bad things have gotten on this issue. And I'm truly sorry uh, that this has happened to many of you and it's affected a lot of you uh, personally. So if I can help in any way, um, please let me know. And if you have information for me, Maybe how I can be better informed on this issue because, again, um, I've, I was very upfront in saying that I have not studied this issue as much as some of you probably have. And so there's a lot that I uh, still have to learn on this, a lot that I may even be wrong on on this. And I am fully and completely willing uh, to be corrected on anything if I've stated uh, that was incorrect. So please leave uh, your thoughts and uh, your comments on this, and I'm sure this will be a continuing uh, discussion, and I'm sure more videos will come. In fact, uh, this next article is talking about providing comfort for victims of abuse, and we're just going to ask whether the Watchtower um, is actually doing a good job of dealing with people who've already been abused, and maybe even people who have dealt with the governing authorities and allowed them to do their job, and how do you deal with this after uh, the fact. So, uh, I hope this was a beneficial review for you, so thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. For more information about Jehovah's Witnesses and other topics, please visit michaeljfelker.com. There you can also reach me directly to submit questions or comments to be covered on the JW Review. To subscribe to this podcast, please go to iTunes and search for the JW Review.